In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our lessons this morning focus on David and Jesus at the start of their ministries, and with David welcoming the endorsement of the various clan leaders in the nation of Israel who are holding him up now as king. And the writer of Samuel says that he was king for 40 years. And this is an auspicious new beginning for David, optimism and hope for what's coming next. Not unlike Jesus, when he goes to his hometown synagogue. Now they know him, they watched him grow up. They know his mother, they know his, his family. And all of a sudden he's talking to them and doing miracles and they're perceiving it as somehow he's putting himself above them. And they take offense. And he really can't do anything with them because they're closed which is an interesting dynamic to explore about how Jesus is or is not able to work miracles among people. As I said last week in a sermon, part of healing is our intentional going after it. But if their unbelief, they weren't going after it, they weren't going to get it. So he wasn't able to do much with them. Then he tells his disciples, Go to these various towns and villages and give them the message. And don't take all this extra stuff. Because what you give should entitle you to good hospitality wherever you go. Because the message is real. You should be received honestly and fully. And if you're not, he says, shake the dust from your shoes as a testimony against them and leave. Sounds harsh, but there's also some truth in it. We, as followers of Jesus, as spiritual seekers, as people trying to be better, we have a message to give. We have a witness to give, and our witness is our own story. I can tell you about my spiritual journey. I can tell you about the successes I've had, the achievements I've had, you know, yay. But I can also tell you about the failures I've had, the embarrassments I've had. Oddly enough, <laughs> it's the failures and the embarrassments that prove to be better lessons than the achievements do. I'm often saying that the mistakes I make are either expensive, embarrassing, or fattening. But either way, the lessons I've learned have come pretty much as a result of one of those three areas. And when I can connect with someone on the mistakes that I've made rather than the achievements I've, I've had, that's some real connection. When Jesus sent the disciples out, and he said, don't take all this extra stuff, all this extra baggage. Just allow your words to be your entree into the community. That's a scary proposition for the disciples. It puts them in a very vulnerable position. But they did. They went. And they actually were successful in their mission and in their ministry. And it's a beautiful lesson for us. And part of this, whether it's David or whether it's Jesus at his home synagogue or the disciples as they go around to the different places, we never know how people are going to respond to the messages that we give. Will they be open and receptive or will they be closed and offended? And in that offense, be, they're being offended or feeling offended, they will be offensive. There's another part in one of the Gospels where this same, this same scene is fleshed out a little bit more, and Jesus is preaching in the synagogue his first time at his home parish. They actually get so angry, they, they lift him bodily, carry him up to a hill in, in town, and they're going to pitch him over the side. I can't imagine 
what he said that got them that riled. But it's part of the language of story. We never know how people are going to react. And because we don't know, it impacts how open and how intentionally we state our point of view and how open we are in our message. If I go into a group of people that I know have a different opinion than I do, how is that going to alter what I say? I might couch my words differently, but I have the option of not saying anything at all, choosing not to go into a room that I believe might become hostile or unknown. My fear of rejection might preempt me from going in in the first place. Or I might go in and try to say only what I know is going to be pleasing to the crowd or I can go in and just speak and allow my words to be what they are. Because I do have a message, I do have experience, I do have a story, and it's mine. My story is uniquely mine. The lessons I've learned from my story may resonate and be similar to the same stories that other people have. But the, ex but the circumstances and the events are uniquely mine. And when I tell my story, there really is no argument against it. I mean, what happened in my life happened in my life. What's happened in your life happened in your lives. There's, that's not up for debate. What happened happened. What we've learned from it, how we've interpreted our lives, that's where the conversation begins. That's where the learning happens. That's where the humility is. Paul gets to that in his letter to the Corinthians a little bit in his very Paulish kind of way, which is a sometimes very murky. I mean, he, he, whenever Paul says, I don't boast, I don't have to boast, but he can't leave it alone. I don't have to boast. But if I did boast, and then he tells you what he's going to boast about. He's very proud of his humility. <laughs> but you've got to love him. Because he does come out with things that really are meaningful. And say a lot. He really does love Jesus. He really does love the people to whom he is ministering and he wants what's best for them. And he wants them to accept this message of grace and love. Sometimes he's very clumsy, but it's always, I believe it is always sincere. And why that doesn't bother me so much is because I am often clumsy in how I proclaim. I am often clumsy in the messages I give. But I do hope and believe that the messages come from a sincere place and a good place. When I give a message, especially in, in an otherwise empty room to a, um, to a recording device, I have no idea how the message I give is going to be received. And yet it's what's in me and I give what I can. I will say that I do enjoy a room full of people and I can read the energy of the people who are watching and listening and that is a real pleasure. But regardless, whether it's to a recording device or to a room full of people, my message needs to be my message and my message is always the love of God, the inclusion of God's love for all people the embrace of those who are scattered and those who are close, those who feel hurt and those who feel unworthy, to draw them in and to all, always say, we've all felt unworthy at one time or another. 
We've all felt hurt and put out at one time or another. But the love of God calls us in, calls us back, so that we can strengthen our understanding of that love, deepen in our understanding of ourselves and our relationship with God, to feel that God's love does reach us and has made us worthy and makes us count. When Jesus sent his disciples out, the message they gave was one of repentance, telling the people, repent, repent. I saw someone with a sign that said that um, up on Vernon, uh, Vernon Street, just up past Kelly Square. They were standing at the intersection. And, it's, and the sign said, repent, Jesus is coming. I thought, wow. I wish I had the nerve to do that. I, I don't, but I wish I did. Imagine feeling that strongly that you're going to go out in traffic with a sign that says repent. That's, that was her message. When I say repent, it might be a different nuance for the word. Repent means to turn around, to look at what we're doing that isn't healthy, and to make other choices that bring us more in line with what we say we believe about the love of God. Repent is not this big dramatic event, although it could be. More often than not, repentance is the realization that we've made unhealthy decisions and that we have to turn and make better decisions. That's what the disciples went out to preach. And Jesus said, don't take all this extra stuff. And for the modern day preacher or the modern day person who proclaims, and we are all preachers, by the way, not just me in this pulpit, we are all preachers because we all proclaim a message of God's love to those who will hear it. And it takes different shapes, but we are all preachers. And as we give that message, we don't have to fortify it with with all of these quotes and footnotes and quotes from other authors are nice because they are able to put into words what we believe. But our basic message has got to be our own from our own heart. And that makes it more vulnerable because it's from us. If I tell you what another author says, I'm not as vulnerable because if you have an argument with it, you have an argument with them, not me. But if I'm telling you something from my heart, something from my opinions, my brain, I'm the one who will take the criticism. And that makes me vulnerable. And sometimes I'm strong enough to be vulnerable and sometimes I'm not. But Jesus says, don't take all this extra stuff. Don't pad it. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Let your message be your message right from the heart in the language that is best suited to articulate where you are, who you are, and what your message is. It's an invitation, but even more than that, it is a sending out. Jesus sent his disciples out, and Jesus sends us out into the world be vulnerable, but to know that we are, in fact, strengthened by the love of God and by the presence of God in our hearts and in our spirits. Sent out. Go. Proclaim. Be strong. And come back here and talk about how we did. Talk about the lessons learned, the relationships forged, and the understanding of God that was developed. I'm going to close with this. I will often say, whether it's sermons or in individual conversations, I will never tell you what to believe. Never. I will tell you what I believe. I will ask you what you believe. And in the conversation between us, 
I believe God is active. And that's an invitation that deepens me, enriches me, and I believe enriches the conversation between us. And I always will ask God to bless the space between us. Amen.